So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. I'm Lisa Hammond from The Next Step, and I'm very excited to welcome you all to the last of our four-part series, Being Your Best Self. We have had a record number of people register for today's webinar, which is fantastic. So being resilient is obviously a topic that has certainly struck a chord with our HR community and beyond. There's certainly a lot of names that I recognise, so uh, hello to you all and um, great to have you all on board. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Firstly, there is no need to worry if you've missed any or all of the previous sessions as these modules on being intentional, being focused and being optimistic can be accessed through the Next Step website at any time. Uh, hopefully everyone's received a copy of the workbook. If not, please let us know in the chat ASAP and we'll get you a copy. Um, like always, we're keen to keep this session as interactive as possible. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand or pop any questions or comments in the chat box and we'll endeavour to address these during or at the end of the presentation. So let's get started. Once again, and for the last time this year, I am thrilled that The Next Step is partnering with the wonderful Vanessa Porter and Chris Wilson from ChangeFit. ChangeFit has cre was created by Vanessa and Chris to support us to build our mental, physical and emotional capability to be our best selves. Today, Vanessa and Chris will take us through the final module, Being Resilient, and we'll take us through some exercises to build our inner strength. Resilience is defined as the ability to recover quickly from difficulties. We often talk about the ability to bounce back. However, today, Vanessa and Chris are going to help us to tap into our strengths and support system to really bounce forward into 2022. Welcome, Vanessa and Chris. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. Really appreciate it, Lisa. And um, like you were saying, this is all about increasing our bandwidth. So many people think we're kind of born with a bandwidth and it has to stay at that. But we know from neuroscience that that can actually increase. It's like a muscle that the more we practice, the more it increases. So that's good news for all of us here. Mm -hmm. Chris, if I could just get you to move to the next slide. Thank you. So we want to check in how you're going. Those of you who have um, been to some of the other sessions that we've run, you know that we've, uh, we've gone through being intentional, focused and optimistic. If you could just pop in the chat how many of these sessions you've actually been to, that's really useful for us, particularly as we start planning for the next year to see where we want to drill down into a bit more detail and that will really shape the sessions. So great to see some of you. Um, it's, it's, it's your very first one. For others, um, we've got some return people here. I think we've, we've got just over 240 registered today. So um, Lisa, yes, of course, four Thanks, out Lisa. of four, which is great. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. So just take a moment. This is the, the, we call it the genius model that we put together to really see how these things interact together. So you can see there that we're really focusing in on the resilient um, circle today, which is about how we reset and how we recover. And that's not just from a mental or emotional um, point of view, but also from a physicality point of view as well. How we take ownership for what we can control and move forward and also how we choose to respond that we don't just let emotions become us that actually we've got a choice what we want to let in and also what we want to let go of so just take a moment in your workbook this is on page two just put a circle around particular the being the resilient right now where would you rate yourself if you think about where you're at coming into the last month of the year, where would you rate yourself? And if you wouldn't mind sharing that in the chat, it'd be great to know our starting point and then see if we can increase that in the next hour together. Just a number would be awesome.
fives and sevens are ish. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the fence. <laughs> Matt's doing well at eight there. Some fours and fives, some eight from Rob as well. Yeah, okay. So it looks like we've only, we've got four through to eight, but quite a lot around that six mark at the moment there. And look, this can bounce around. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I thought I was doing really, really well. And I would say that I'd probably say I was a nine out of 10. Everything was going well. Business was going well. I'm in the middle of renovations, completely gutted the ground floor. All was good until I decided to do one other thing. And that was to adopt another rescue dog. And then pandemonium hit. <laughs> and I'll share a story with you about what happened the first time I left him alone in a bathroom. No one could have ever expected that in a million years. He's supposed to be a border collie cross Kelpie about nine months old. He's a German shepherd. <laughs> <laughs> It's as simple as that. And I've already got a rescue who's a Kelpie. So two, uh, two interesting boys together. What fun they can get into. Um, thank God no animals were hurt, but it got pretty damn close. All right, so let's get, let's get moving along. If you wouldn't mind, Chris, if you could just forward. So as Lisa said, what is the definition? Um, we've got the formal definition that we've come back here, which is all about making sure that we're really elastic, that we can bend and flex and come back when things happen. And we can kind of get to that, that, that level of normality there. Just want to open it up. And if you want to come off um, mute, that's fine. Or if you want to write in the chat, what is being resilient mean for you right now? Is it pure survival? Is it more than that? What, what does being resilient mean for you right now? Who's going to be the first? <laughs> Take each day as it comes, yeah. Getting it over the line. Yeah, everyone's saying there's a lot of build-up for Christmas, isn't there? Seeing a brighter future. Yeah, rolling with resistance, love it not feeling overwhelmed, yeah. That was certainly my definition last Saturday. Yeah, love that, optimistic for next year, keeping the big picture, being present. Yeah, there's some beautiful things here. <laughs> not crying every time another trip is cancelled. Oh, I know Fair we're much. so used to just having that thing to look forward to and then we can't anymore, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, about not being too hard on ourselves. So surviving's good and finding, I'm finding a lot of joy in little things. Yeah, great. Keeping strong. Regroup, yeah. Hopefully this is a bit of that regroup for us today as we share together and see that we're, we're in the similar boat to everybody else there. Thank you. Chris, if you wouldn't mind just flicking over, thank you. I'm going to pass over to Chris now, who's going to explain what we mean by resilience in a bit more detail. As you can see, we really like to look at it in a holistic point of view because we know it impacts every part of our being. Over to you, Chris. Thanks, Vanessa. So we don't want to... We don't want to challenge your thinking. We just want to extend it or shift it slightly towards this topic where whenever I go into organisations or I have these conversations about resilience, it's always thrown into the mental space. You know, we've got to think happy thoughts and build our resilience. And it's, it's simply not true. From a physiological, from a human perspective, we can uh, think about it from a cellular level. So I work, I'm a stress scientist. I work in the physio physiology of humans and measure cortisol and stress markers. We can actually increase the resilience of a cell to be able to cope with more cortisol and to be able to look at all the stress impact and all the, the, the metabolic rate and the, 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 the health of the cell. We can adapt this 
which means we can tolerate more. So from a physical, mental and emotional sense, we can build resilience in all those key areas. And that, uh, that human centered conversation, we can strengthen our holistic resilience by working on all three key areas. Now, um, if you look at your workbook, you've got that on page three. I'm asking you to consider this and we're, we're just framing here. So we're just trying to get you to consider your physical, mental and emotional. And if you want ROI, if you want to talk in those terms, uh, if you were to increase your physical resilience, we all understand the benefits we get from that. If we can make you fitter, we can, you know, cardiorespiratory, the vascular system, the, the muscular system, all these things can be improved with this physical resilience piece. But then we look at our emotional and mental. So in the workbook, what I'd love for you to do is just write down, what's your strength in this area? What's your strength in the physical? What's your strength in the emotional? What's your strength in the mental? As you reflect on those three key areas, just then flip it and go, right, what's my opportunity? Where can I improve my resilience in these three key areas? It can be as big or as small as you like. Okay. We do love to chat. We love to engage with you. That's the whole point of you spending your time with us today. So when it comes to opportunities, would you, you know, only share what you're happy to share with, but could you put something in the chat? Tell us whether it's your physical, mental or emotional, and then tell us where your opportunities are to increase your resilience. Maybe just put a, a P, E or M at the beginning of it just to signal which domain it's coming from. Always the details for you, Vanessa. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, go for it. Just chuck it in there. See what happens. <laughs> Trying to make it a bit easier. <laughs> and yeah, okay. okay. We've got our first one in, folks. You won't be first. So what are your opportunities? Okay, flexible in terms of less rigid. Okay, beautiful, flexible thinking. We love that. Yeah, good, Lisa. Multiple points of view. Trying to put yourself in other people's is really difficult in a stressful situation. We know that. It's really, we lose the empathy part of our prefrontal cortex and our brain. So yeah, brilliant one. Mental coolness under pressure. Nice, Martin. Yeah, the snappiness of being able to think on your feet in the moment. Yeah. Knowing my stress is welcome, Sally. I tell you, yeah. Gratitude is an interesting one. I'm going to talk about that, Carla. Mm. A positive think and a positive attitude. Yeah, I love that. Debrief support. Yeah, growth mindset. Thanks, Carol. Jane said it, but it's Carol Dweck I was thinking of. <laughs> yeah. That's powerful, Bernadine. That's really great. Just a few more. Application of kindness. Right now, we all need a little bit more kindness, don't we? You, For sure. I'm in South Australia, so, you know, you Sydney siders and Melbournians. <laughs> Sorry. Better rest and sleep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. So we've got those three key areas there. You've identified, with, you know, we're thinking about this physical, mental and emotional. We're thinking about you're great in some areas. Of course we are. We do have opportunities where we can start to build that resilience piece. So the next step from there, you've, you've got a picture. Where, again, I said to you, we're framing this. Um, there's two things you want to consider when it comes to resilience. One is, we need to allocate time to reset and recover. We have to. No one's saying that we shouldn't be in a stressful situation. We need to be challenged, of course we do. But we, we're very poor at allocating time for the body to downregulate and for the brain to downregulate and reset. The second one is that you are, because of your positions in an organization, 
you're probably a leader of some sort or you manage people. So today, whenever we talk about the subjects we talk about in the talk, I just want you to apply it to yourself for now. I know Sandra says she's got a team of 10 in here somewhere. So that is a group of individuals and we want you to focus on yourself for now. We've got to understand that it's your responsibility to manage your emotions, to put things in place, to activate and use these tools. And only then can we, we see change. Now, I'll keep coming back to the workbook. There's a question at the top of page four, and it says, how much of your day, what percentage of your day do you spend highly stressed? Just put a number in there. I'm not gonna ask you to share that, by the way. But in your opinion, how much of your day is spent in a, in a highly stressed state? We could put a number down there. We haven't measured it. It might not be accurate, but just in your own mind. So when we remain in this high stress state, there are changes that occur in the body. Now we've been through these on a few different webinars. You know, in my world, I'm, I map and measure hormones and, and different stress markers. But there are telltale signs of when we're going into this high stress state. We call them the early warning signs. So on your post-it note, the imaginary post-it note on the left hand side of the page, it's asking you for three early warning signs. And these can be physical, mental, or emotional. How do you know you're going into a high stress state? How do you know that you're being challenged? Here's a confession. I love to throw my wife and my daughter into these webinars. It's just, you know, just my own little world. Um, my wife, Kate, will often say to me, you need to go for a bike ride. And I, I know, we all know what that cue means now. I'm getting a bit growly. I'm getting a bit, just, just go and exercise and just go and burn something off. So sometimes I don't recognize it. Sometimes the people around me recognize it first. But how do you know? Okay, so early warning signs. It's chat time, please. Bear with us. Um, you can pick one or put all three in there. I just want to know, what are your early warning signs? This is going to be relevant to the next few slides for us. So share some of your early warning signs. How do you know you're getting negatively stressed? Tolerance, yeah, upset, happy, and I'm not happy, yes. Interest in Emma, yep. Procrastination is avoidance. Burning ears. Ah, oh, it's just skipped. Who put burning ears? <laughs> I love that. Lack of patience, focus. Yep. Yeah. Hot and angry. Yep. Yeah. Luke, classic. Yep. Yeah. Increased pace and punchiness. James, I love that. Increased pace and punchiness. Tension around my head. Yep. Yeah. So what we can see, thanks, Sarah, that's my world, fight off light. Sally, completely off script because that's how I roll. Um, sugar fuel stress. That's why we crave it when we're in stressful situations. Cortisol's role is to mobilize energy and, and sugar gives us that kick. Yeah, headache, tension headaches. Mm. So you can see there's such a beautiful array there of physical, mental, and emotional um, markers that tell us the, the, the early warning signs. Um, so the last bit here on the, in the workbook is that right-hand side of the page is just what area of resilience do you need to work on? Is it your physical, your mental, or your emotional? Try and identify or prioritize one. If you looked at your early warning signs, You don't need to share that one with me. Hmm. Okay. So what have we done? We've taken a little whirlwind there, haven't we? We've taken you through, you've, you've reflected on yourself. You're starting to consider, what is it? How do I know? How do I feel? Sometimes even thinking about being stressed can cause those physical, mental and emotional reactions. 
So part of our Change Fit program, Vanessa and I have created lots of content that we can deliver. And I'm just going to share with you how I've wrapped up this whole stress model and how it fits in with resilience. We'd like to introduce you to our stress model. So the first thing we're going to create is a simple model for you to follow. And then we'll start to look at a typical day that we come across in our world. If we look at the very bottom of the model, we have what we call our baseline, which is how we start our day. We wake up, we look at our phone, lots of triggers are going off. We know that we've got a certain time frame before maybe our children wake up or something goes on and I don't have time to eat because I need to get to work. Now I'm at work and it just keeps trickling in. And eventually we're going to go into an area where we start to look at changes in our physical, mental and emotional states that will help identify that we're going into a high stress state. We call these our early warning signs. Now the, the line between the baseline and the early warning signs, this is where we want to play. Absolutely, 100%. We want to expose you to stress. That's vital for us. And if we want to build resilience, we need to be able to experience these stresses, but bring ourselves back down into our healthy zone. Now, the tools that you're learning on this program, we should be able to identify our early warning signs nice and early, use the tools to downregulate, to de-stress and bring us back into that healthy zone. If you can do that, you can actually raise the distance between your baseline and your early warning signs, which is really important for us. We're trying to raise your resilience by raising, if you want to call it a bandwidth between the baseline and the early warning signs. If they go unattended, if we ignore those, we then start to keep our stress levels rising. And as they rise, we can then get into a, a, a sense of overwhelm where we're not coping very well our resilience is poor now, we can't bring ourselves back in. And so we really start to have a negative impact on not only our work, our surroundings and the people around us, but also our own health. Of course, if we come back to our healthy zone, our baseline is always dependent on our recovery and our sleep and how much we can tolerate and the environment in which we're in. Our body has a pattern within our stress. It has a day pattern and a night pattern. Something we should be aware of is if we get into a state of overwhelm and we remain in that state, normally by the time we've finished our day of work and trying to get home, our physiological levels and our stress levels and our, our, our well-being levels are still too high, which means we can't settle down to get into a nice relaxing rhythm for sleep. Now the day pattern will directly affect the night pattern and if we have a poor sleep, uh, uh, disturbed sleep during the night and we don't allow recovery, our baseline the next morning has now become a lot closer to our early warning signs level. That bandwidth is shortened. Our triggers, our early warning signs come on a lot quicker. So we return back into a state of overwhelm in a much shorter space of time. Now, can just reflect quickly about how that would affect your your productivity at work your daily routines and your joy of being at work and then also in truth we also need to understand how that would directly affect our relationships at home our friendships our mentality and our, our mindset and all the negative things that can occur so what we want to be able to do is for you to identify what your early warning signs are and what tools work for you to downregulate and de-stress to bring you back into your healthy zone. Listening to your own voice is always very strange, isn't it? <laughs> not it, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> That's not my voice at all. That was put on for the video, but there we go. Uh, so there we are. It's just, it's just a short, brief animation that, that walks us through this whole concept that you know, we need, it's fluid. We can't always be at a set level of like, what is this resilience level we're all aiming to get? And sometimes it's just about, you know, adapting and the flexible thinking around, well, what is it right now and where do I need to be and how can I improve it? Was there anything in that video that stood out for you? Was there any one thing 
that uh, really resonated with you? If you could pop that in the chat. By the way, we keep leaning on chat. If you want to come off your mic and be brave enough to speak, go for it. We love it. Yeah, sleep's a huge one, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. The impact on our whole being on the whole day. Mm. Yeah. So there's two things that are really standing out, and I can see that the chat's coming through. What we do is we believe we have to accelerate all through the day, and that's the pattern and the rhythm we create. We get up with an alarm, we accelerate, and then we've got to give 100% of work and be everything to everyone at all times. And then, and then we're supposed to suddenly shut our brain off and go into this beautiful, relaxing sleep. And it doesn't really work for, I, my wife can fall asleep on a, anywhere. She just closes her eyes and goes, I don't, I take time and I have to really build into my sleep. What we do know though, is through poor quality sleep, our tolerance levels drop the next day. And this can be a pattern we create. So then we become anxious about going to sleep because we know it's going to be you know, a, a poor experience for us. And so we start to create this whole, oh my God, it's getting to bedtime. I really need to relax. And we start to amp ourselves up. And so there are two things. One is um, we get anxious and we wake ourselves up. Normally 2 a.m., 2 to 3 a.m. is when we wake up, need a pee. And then our brain starts to accelerate again. Um, but also, we then create the habit of waking up and that's something to be aware of. And then, you know, we, we've spoken about it today. We start to lose that emotional regulation. We start to lose empathy. We start to hijack this, this beautiful piece at the front of the brain that allows us to do our executive functions. And so really, yet yeah, sleep can impact resilience, tolerance, motivation and drive. If only there was a magic pill we could take to all sleep, like dream boats. <laughs> now, no, that's not what I want. There you go. Vanessa, over to you. Thanks, Chris. I just wanted to share with you a particular technique for those of you who get caught particularly in the emotional side of things or the mental side and then we'll talk a little bit more about the sleep um, towards the end so as I mentioned to you um, on Saturday night I'd had the dog since Thursday and I needed to go well I wanted to go out and catch up with friends up the road literally um, for a drink so I'd been thinking about it all through the day. What could I do to make sure my new dog was safe, my old dog was safe? Because you don't leave two dogs together um, within the first couple of weeks. So I'd worked it all out. I had made him really, really comfortable with the bathroom. He'd been in and out during the day. I'd been and got half a marrow bone for them each. Everything was going to be perfect. I'd made it all secure, taken everything out of the bathroom, all was good. Other dog was in a separate room, same kind of deal. So that was fine. I went out, had a couple of drinks, came home about 40 minutes later. I opened up the bathroom door and immediately the smoke alarms went off. Every single one throughout the house, I've got three levels, off they went. I walked in and the shower, he pushed, his name's Jed, had pushed the opening of the shower and turned the shower taps on full bore, hot, hot, steaming hot water. Also in the vanity sink, he'd also turned that on. Obviously, he'd been watching me far too much. Burning hot water as well. And then dripping from the ceiling and every single wall was the condensation. Opened up the vanity cupboards, every single product was just wet as. And he was saturated as well, um, but not scalded. I just was beyond myself and I was absolutely petrified. I was really, really scared. Um, I was scared of what could have happened. I was scared that with that marrow bone, he could have 
flung it against the shower and it could have shattered all over him. I was scared that he could have got scolded. I was, I felt like a bad dog mum, you know, I was a bad pet parent. And I was just, so what do I do in those situations? My early warning signs are, I become really, really calm under pressure. I just went in and turned off the taps first, then went on a step ladder, pulled out all the batteries out of the smoke alarms, dried the dog and started to just clean up, which took two hours and 40 minutes. And <laughs> I just get calm and get productive and just deal with the situation. But then afterwards, I could feel the tears welling up and I thought, wow, I've let this dog down. I've let my other dog down. Oh, my goodness, it's going to be an adoption fail and all of those things. And so as I kind of caught myself in this emotional piece, I remembered this, and this is something that I um, worked a lot with the Sydney Opera House on, this con concept of actors on the stage. And that it is natural to have these thoughts and feelings and emotions, and I was very clear which ones I, I was experiencing at that time. But they're not supposed to take centre stage. They're not supposed to dominate. They're not supposed to stay there forever so that I can never, ever go out again. I never feel like this dog is okay to be left alone or with the other dog. So I needed to just think, okay, I felt this really strong sense of being scared and I now need to ask it to leave so that I can return to normal because obviously the dogs can pick up on that, that as well. And we're all exhausted now and everybody's safe now and we want to get a good night's sleep because at this stage you know it's close to one o'clock in the morning and that was the trick in that moment for me and it's something that I rely upon heavily is just to think as the really strong feelings thoughts emotions as they come just to let them and if you feel like they're staying and trying to take on center stage for too long acknowledge it and let them exit stage right, yeah? And don't think that because you've had that thought or you're feeling or emotion that it becomes you, yeah? Try to make that distance and separate from the two. And maybe one day, maybe it's a little bit too early now, you can actually laugh at it, you know? In a few years' time, I'll remember, you know, that first night that I let out when I see a perfectly uh, calm dog. And already, you know, I've got both of them lying here with me. Um, so if you see me, you know, rush off video, it's because I'm, I'm trying to deal with the, the next little emergency that comes. But I don't think any of them will be quite as bad as that one. <laughs> so how do we feel back in control? Um, and this is part of that stress journey as well. Uh, we all have heard of Covey circles before, and I don't know how you've used them, but this is something that I suggest as an exercise for people to do. It's in workbook page five. What I'll get you to do is just to spend three minutes just writing down every single thing that's whirling around in your brain right now. Normally I get people to do it with a pack of post-it notes and every single thought, however big or small, gets a post-it note. And then I end up with these post-it notes everywhere. By the way, I do this on a Friday night so that I can then go into the weekend knowing what I can and can't do. So I'll just ask you to take three minutes just to write down, you can write it in the circles if you want, you can put it around the circles or grab out some post-it notes. Just every single thought that's whirling around or emotion um, that's going on for you right now. You know, if it's, oh my goodness, I forgot to take something out for lunch or, oh, I've got to remember to do that proofing at the end of the day or, oh, tomorrow I've got this done. Whatever it is that's filling up your brain, just get it down on a piece of paper. Sometimes just the mere act of getting it all out, make sure that you're not holding on to all of that stuff and trying to remember it all. 
So just three minutes just to write down whatever's going on. Your work life, your personal life, physical life, spiritual life, balancing, Christmas for some, that's a stress in itself. For others, it's a joy. But, oh, my goodness, do I have to write cards, get presents? How am I just going to get through till the end of the year? What are all those things for you right now? I remember mentoring somebody at the Sydney Opera House and um, she kept on writing. And after 40 minutes, I said to her, are we nearly done? And she said, no, I've still got things in my head. And we spent just under an hour with her just emptying all the things that were in her head. Extraordinary. We've seen some beautiful ways in which our clients have used this as a tool. And it was that beautiful link between getting really into the finite details of your early warning signs and then understanding that self-awareness piece about knowing when they're coming and what they what they are and and then using that as a trigger to go, right, I need to get my post-it notes out and I'm just gonna empty my thoughts, clear my thoughts. So the link between the early warning signs as not a trigger, but as a, a moment to understand what's going on for you, to know that I need to act on something. And this, this circle piece was a really beautiful um, way. Should we just empty your thoughts and get rid of the, the apprehension, and the anxiety? And yes, Lisa, um, how many thoughts do we have a day was your question. Thank you for it. Um, on average, the, the people have 50 to 55,000 thoughts a day and about 90% of them are the same thoughts that we had the day before and the day before and the day before that. And in terms of um, little messages that we send one another and those can be little microaggressions or micro inequities or micro affirmations which is the positive side of it is on average about 4,000 a day that we send to beings around us whether they be animal or whether they be human yeah so very very subtle but a lot that can make a really big difference there so yeah a heck of a lot yes 90 percent repeated thoughts sky each day yeah so if we really want to get to the cutting edge of our thoughts then we really need to guarantee one another that we're not going to interrupt one another and actually help us to get that independent thought there um sorry that's a particular passion of mine um, that i get involved in there so once you've got this what what this is basically saying to us is this is, we, we look at that list and then we go, okay, well, what are the ones that we can control? And then we move those post-it notes into what we can control. Quite often we find that those post-it notes are just things that we can only influence. We don't have total control over, or they're things that really concern us, but we have no control whatsoever. So, 
what we're trying to do here is to take back control, to take that responsibility, to take that ownership and just focus in on the things that we can control first and foremost. So put yourself back in the centre of your life, quite literally, is taking that control. Where the stress happens is where we are trying to control things that we can only influence or that we're concerned about. And that's where the stress, that's where the mix match comes into play. So if you want to not have that stress and you want to try to um, have more calmness and peace in your life, then it is really focusing in, really on yourself. That's the only thing that you can control, yeah? And you can increase that bandwidth as well. I always think about Isla, my daughter, uh, and, I, and I'd love to imagine I can control her, but I can't. I really can't. <laughs> I can bribe her <laughs> or influence her. <laughs> Shall we? Are you ready to move on? Yeah, Natasha, just one question there. What if the list goes on and it's all stuff you can control? Yeah, and, and that that is a reality. I guess that's a matter of prioritizing so then working out whether it be for that day for that week for that quarter what are the the one non-negotiable that you need to get done and then just focus in on that that's what I normally do I kind of set my well Chris knows this I kind of do sprints um, so I always work on three projects at a time yeah, and as you can tell what those are right now, it's finishing the year from my business perspective, it's completing my ground floor renovations and successfully adopting a new dog. So whenever I'm looking at that list that goes on and on and on and on, and trust me, yeah, there's 37 things around the dog right now that I've got on the list. I just go, what's the one thing I can do today that moves me in a positive direction for it? So it might be that I just do my 10 minutes of training with him. It might just be that. So just make sure it's moving you in the right direction of your top three priorities and that's it. And be really intentional about that at the beginning of the day. If you want to talk more about that, Natasha, um, please reach out to me and, and we can have a, a conversation offline. Thanks, Chris. So if you've got some stuff in that influence or in that concern piece and you are genuinely worried about it, you know, I've certainly had that um, before, what I do and I found really, really useful for me is I schedule worry time. Now that probably sounds really, really bizarre, but I give myself 20 minutes and I schedule it in as an appointment and it's worry time about that thing, yeah? And I, I answer these questions. What am I worried about? What's the worst thing that can happen? Is there something I can do? Great. If it is, then I'll write it down, add it to my list, and I'll schedule it in to do something about it. But if there is nothing that I can do about it and I can't impact the outcome, or I'm not going to put myself in a position to extend myself and actually get concerned um, even further, which is normally from a political point of view. I have pretty firm views around things. It's like, well, I'm not going to run in an election. So let it go. Hold it a bit lightly. And with those things, I literally get that piece of paper that I've written it up on. I screw it up. Sometimes I burn it and I throw it away. And with that, the worry goes away. And it's that physical act for me of actually doing something with it that makes it disappear for me. Um, so that's what I use in terms of those things that I can only influence or that I'm concerned about. Hopefully that's, that's something you might find useful for you as well. Okay. So... Where I play in the brain, if that's a thing, is I play in the limbic part of the brain. So we look at the hippocampus, the amygdala, 
thalamus and hypothalamus is the central mammalian part of the brain. It drives the fight or flight response. So the most significant part for us is this hippocampus. It converts our short-term memories during the sleep phase, the deep sleep phase. We convert short-term memories into long-term. So what Venice has just taken you through is an opportunity in which you can change the frame. You can change your perspective on a, on a situation just by going through this process. And, and let me explain why, from my point of view, that's essential. Strong words, I know. If we are at the end of our day reflecting on our day from a negative perspective, when we go to sleep, we reinforce the negativity in the brain. And then the next day we look for the biases that tell us, yes, I knew I was right. See, I told you. And so what we end up doing is we get this, this negative reinforcement. So what we want to do is at the end of the day, when we, you know, typically the people I deal with, my clients, they get apprehensive and anxious at the end of the day. And that's when they start to accelerate the brain just before bed. And it puts us into this, um, it's really difficult to get into that deep sleep, quality sleep. So if you can allow yourself this worry time, what that will do is it will change your perspective and your viewpoint on what happened during your day. You know, the all, the all time classics of I should have done this, I could have done that. What if I'd done this? You change that vocabulary and that language in your head and you just give a positive outlook on, you know, what did happen during the day. Bless her, Isla's not here to defend herself, but my eight-year-old, <laughs> I don't know how many times I say it, sorry. She's the, she's the joy and the bane of my life. <laughs> um, she's a rose. <laughs> if, if, I was, if I pick her up from school and I say to her, you know, what happened today? She will give me the negatives that happened in the day. Oh, I fell over. Oh, someone told me off and um, I didn't do this. Okay, if I change the language around that, like what, what great things happened today or what filled your bucket, then she will change, completely change that viewpoint. However, we have to acknowledge the fact that the brain will always prioritize the negative. And in this forum, I can't ask questions, but the reason why is it wants to look at all the pain points, what can cause me harm, what can cause me pain, what can put me at risk. And it prioritizes those thoughts. And we have to hack that, if you like. We have to override that. Now, these thoughts can be you know, exaggerated in high stress states. We're really deep to the, the detail of why it's negative and what it can do. I don't have to explain this. We've all been through this over the last year, you know, with lockdowns, and everything else that's gone on. We really start to hone in when our resilience is challenged and we start to get engulfed by that negativity. So we want to be able to change our thought process and what state we are in before we go to sleep can actually start to get that positive, that upward cycle of that positive reinforcement. So things like the worry time, the gratitude rituals and changing your perception of the actions and events that took part in your day can really change the physiology of the body, which can also help you regulate your emotional, physical and mental resilience. Now, if you look at your workbook, we've got these beautiful slides in the corner. What I'd love for you to do is on the right hand side, I'm thinking about time, Vanessa, but what we could do, is, if you could work through the right hand side of those slides, you can see that it's asking you questions. You know, what, what will you commit to? So when it comes to worry times, when will you allocate time for this? We're asking you to start taking action is the key thing here. So if you look at those questions on the right hand side, just start to jot a few notes down in your workbook. One thing I was just going to add to what you were saying before, Chris, it just came to mind when you're talking about, you know, when you're working with Isla, it's about changing that viewpoint by asking her what went great for the day um, mm. when she was at school. And quite often when we're talking about gratitude rituals, we ask people to write down at least five things that they're grateful for in that day, however big or small. And I'm, I'm not sure how many of you know about Gottman and the Gottman Institute, but he has been doing research 
both in professional as well as personal relationships for the last 30 years. And what he also um, found out is just for you to feel like you're in balance is to have five good things to one bad thing that happens in a day. So that's why with the gratitude rituals, we need you to have at least five things that you're grateful for before you go to sleep. Rather, otherwise it's gonna, it's that, that negative thing is going to override it. And that's not what we want you to focus on before you go to bed, because we want those great long-term memories of all the great things that happened that day. Thanks, Chris. Sorry, I just wanted to add that bit in. That's perfect. It's perfect. Uh, and that's the piece, isn't it? So this will be challenging at first for most of us, especially right now. It's the, it's the act and how you set yourself up to do this on a, a schedule will allow this to become um, actually much more deeper within the mind and the body. And also it becomes easier to process. So bear that in mind. If you find it a bit frustrating at first, it's okay. Most of us do. Yes. It's, the, it's, the, it's the consistency of it that's the key. Okay. So we have a beautiful body clock. Circadian rhythm is what most people would know, I think. Is that common? We've got this day and this night pattern within the body. And one thing we really find is that we don't allocate time to downregulate. Now, this is from a, a mental state as well. So we talk about the, the down regulation of the brain. If we accelerate through the body and this fight or flight response, um, the chemical imbalance it causes within the body is actually very disruptive and even leads to chronic illness and health. We know that the risk of you know, chronic stress loads. So this simple tool I found to be probably the most impactful with my clients because I think the simplicity of it, um, but also the fact that we're asking you, we're giving you license to be selfish. We really, all we're asking you to do is to allocate time in your day where you will have non-negotiables to down-regulate your brain. And that means that just either slow down or to concentrate on self or to be mindful, whatever it is for you that works, just a way in which we can just stop that, that load coming in. So what I've got here is I've got a beautiful example on the top of your workbook. You can see I've put things in there purposely. Very simple. Go for a walk. Allocate time to eat, <laughs> which, I, which, which I find difficult to have these conversations with people. I'm thinking more complex things and people are like, oh, I don't have time to eat. <laughs> okay let's start there um or if they do they're they're using the time to eat like a lunch break to do other things like social media they're just not allowing themselves to down regulate and slow down also got things like meditate if it's your thing it's a tool it's a fantastic tool if you can get into it not everyone's into it uh vanessa and i on the change fit program talk about uh, moving meditation it doesn't have to be sitting still when you're white with whale music and candles that's not that's not my thing anyway and um something simple like laughing like you can't uh, can't force yourself to laugh but it when was the last time we we had that beautiful humor and laughter either in the house or in the office or with our teams um so yeah there's something that we can allocate in our day so my examples on the top part on the bottom part is your, your day. If you think about your day, I'd love for you right now to put in at least, I'm gonna put two, just two things for now that you're gonna to commit to, to put into your day where you allow yourself time to slow down and downregulate. It could be a walk in the morning. It could be go outside for your lunch break. Think about our whole discussion today about you know, the physical, mental and emotional resilience. What were your early warning signs? What was the one key area that you needed to increase or work on? Maybe include that in your day. So, because like all good things, we love you to commit and confess. 
<laughs> would you put into the chat for me what's one non-negotiable thing you're going to put into your into your week into your day into your plan that allows you to downregulate? and i have to say i purposely chose some things that are accessible to everyone and very easy to do on purpose we don't have to go to the gym and do a two-hour workout not at all it could be as simple as putting your trainers on and going around the block as simple as that so what is it Every day, sky's gone large. Good on your sky. Yeah, <laughs> Vanessa, yoga. I love it. I love yoga. Yeah, a book before bed. Slow it down. Yep. Walk the dog. That's Vanessa's world. Right. Reflect on the day. Ah, and leave my I also like there. that, Martin. Mm. Martin, I love that. Music is a great way. You have to be in the moment to to do the um the you, know, the you know the muscular connection between the brain and the fingers yeah kerry why do we rush everything don't we we just want to accelerate out of our day and just i sit on my back deck there's some great journals out there as well so the five minute journal is something i use i normally buy that for for people i work with that's the perfect time of the weather, uh, per perfect time of year to have lunch outside. Get some vitamin D in you as well. Lisa, before midnight, let's go for 11. <laughs> Get outside and look up. Yep, it's a beautiful world out there. These are great, folks. Keep them coming in. Uh, I'm just conscious of, of our time. So Diana, overnight emails, yeah, multiple time zones. If we work across multiple time zones, we have to be, the term I use is we have to be everything to everyone at all times. And it's really difficult to manage that. All right, Chris, I think we may need to um, wrap it up. Yes. Yeah. Look, um, Chris just got you to do a, a piece of action there. Um, what we're really saying is, having listened to the last hour, what's one thing that you can take away? Um, but while you're doing that, um, just open it up. We've only got two minutes left, but if anybody's got a burning question that they'd like to ask, then please feel free to do so. Or in the workbook, you can see our contact details. So by all means, um, yeah, give us a call, reach out to us. We obviously do these um, sessions with The Next Step, but we also run them um, live in person as well as fully online and a blended approach. So if you want to find out more or for your organisation, then please get in touch. Mm. Vanessa, I think it's worth, you've got a beautiful HR support network, haven't you? I do, yeah. Yeah, and I think this this group of collective people, if they want to, um, well, how would they do that? How would they get in contact with you for that? Yeah, look, I run uh, HR peer support networks for both kind of that manager level as well as chief people officer um, level. So we run them every six weeks. Some are in person, some are all virtual um, here in Sydney. And we, we go through a year long program. Um, and really that's about helping one another to solve the challenges that we're facing and also to have some professional development. So if anyone's interested in that, just, just reach out. I, and, and to that point, Vanessa, I certainly encourage uh, people to connect with both Vanessa and Chris on LinkedIn, for example, often sharing articles and uh, fantastic uh, insights, etc., and also tapping into the further information on their website as well. So firstly, I thank you to everyone for being so open today and really sharing throughout the session. Um, these, as Vanessa and Chris will certainly agree, uh, I feel everyone certainly gets more out of it when they are more interactive. But, but on behalf of the next step and all that have, all that have attended today, a huge mm -hmm. thank you again to Vanessa and Chris um, for sharing your personal stories, Vanessa, but for both of you sharing your insights, tools and techniques on being resilient. Um, as always, my workbook, is full and lots of highlighted areas as well. And I really look forward to revisiting 
as I'm sure many of our attendees will also. Um, you know, we'd love to hear what some of the key takeaway things are. And, you know, uh, Chris has taken us through that. So if you haven't put a comment in the chat, please uh, feel free to share. For me, um, I think the so many takeaways, but I think the key one was really being aware of the triggers and those early warning signs. And for me, what I realised, they are all physical and therefore being able to, and being aware of that, really being able to increase that resilience bandwidth between baseline and uh, early signs of stress. So um, as mentioned earlier, this webinar has been recorded and will be uploaded on the Next Step website in the coming week. We will also, you'll also find uh, recordings of all our past webinars, including the other sessions as part of being your best self, in addition to our current HR job index on the website also. Vanessa and Chris, thank you again for your time, not only today, but throughout the year. Um, we really appreciate you being uh, a part of our Next Step HR community and uh, really expanding that uh, in partnership with you, it's been great. So please enjoy the small gifts that are coming your way. Um, I wish you and everyone else uh, the best for the festive season and for a fabulous 2022 and hope these tools are really setting us up to bounce forward. So hope and look forward to seeing you all next year. Yeah, thank you so much for your great participation, everyone. It's been an absolute pleasure.